Turn your Bibles, if you would, to Matthew chapter 5. We're going to finish up Matthew chapter 5 today, and then we're going to head into Advent starting next week, uh, some of which will be from Matthew's gospel, his account of the Christmas story. Um, But we will then go back through the earlier chapters to catch back up to chapter 5. But as we look at these closing words of the Sermon on the Mount in chapter 5, One of the things that we're going to see that's very clear to this part of the passage is the idea that love is central to being a follower of Jesus. Now, we shouldn't be surprised that God uses the word love to describe how we should live. In fact, the Bible tells us that God is love in 1 John chapter 4. And when Jesus was asked what the greatest commandment was, he said to love God and to love our neighbors. But it's become increasingly important to define what we mean by love. More and more, we have so many more definitions in our culture of what it means to be loving. And so we need to ask that second level of question of what do we mean by love? And I thought that'd be an appropriate place to start this morning. What is Christian love? And to help us begin to unpack that, to give us a solid footing on which to stand for the rest of the sermon, I want to go to 1 Corinthians 13. 1 Corinthians 13, not just to be read at weddings, but to be read through all of life for a definition of love. And, And it's important to see the beginning where Paul says if he doesn't have love, everything else he does is literally nothing. But he also gives us in verses 4 to 7 a lot of solid, firm places to stand when we talk about what love is. I'm going to read quickly 1 Corinthians 13, 4-7. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, love believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Now, if we're going to boil that down, on one hand, it's, it's pretty simple. That love is treating others well. But we can't ignore the challenge that comes from understanding how do we love others. Our culture would want to equate love with affirmation. Now, it's true that to love someone is often to affirm someone. But we see from 1 Corinthians 13 that love is bigger than that. And that idea makes me think about Paul's instructions to elders in 1 Timothy. Because in 1 Timothy chapter 3, Paul says that The training ground for an elder is the home. And I think that when one is a parent, it is easy to picture how complicated love can be. What is the loving thing for me to do for my children? How do you answer the question, how do parents love their children? Isn't it honestly, well, it depends. Always motivated by care and compassion, parents are to support and affirm their kids, yes. But there are also times when correction and saying no is in fact the loving thing to do. I think this helps me to understand that love is both simple and complex at the exact same time. And I think this is especially helpful to us as we look at some of the complexities of loving in the Bible, particularly our passage today. So coming to this idea of grounding what love is definitionally in what the Bible says, we will be able to look at Jesus' command to actually love our enemies this morning. Jesus is going to challenge us to love in a better way. 
to, in a sense, love the unlovable. And in doing so, to challenge us to love not just at a bare minimum like everyone else around us, but to love like God himself and to pursue his highest standard of love. So with that being said, let's turn to the text. Let's begin by looking at verse 43. And we'll see some familiar formulations here. Verse 43, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Now we've seen this pattern before where Jesus points to an Old Testament law or an Old Testament tradition. But the first thing we need to notice here, and I hope it stuck out to you, is that while the Old Testament talks about loving your neighbor, never is there a quotation in the Old Testament that says, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. When we read that verse, we need to see that this is a blatant change to the word of God. It's good for us at this point to remember Jesus' words recorded later in Matthew chapter 22. Let me read this because I think it affirms what is actually said in the Old Testament, but it gives, gives no place to what was added to the quote. And one of them, a lawyer, asked Jesus a question to test him. Teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law? And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. So Jesus affirms what was said in places like Leviticus chapter 19 to love our neighbor. And he says you can use that phrase to summarize almost all of the laws as it pertains to other people. But again, I use this to to make very clear that this idea of and hate your enemy is a blatant addition that Jesus never wanted. But secondly, I want to be clear to point out that there are historical records that at the time of Jesus, there were groups that added this to God's word. One particular example is from a monastic community that lived near the Dead Sea, which taught this phrase, love the brothers, hate the outsider. Thirdly, this gave rise to a debate of who is my neighbor. And the New Testament tells us about this. In Luke chapter 10, verse 29, Jesus is asked that question, who is my neighbor? And he responds by telling the story of the Good Samaritan. It should not be surprising for us who believe in the reality of sin that people wanted to find all the loopholes in who was my neighbor. And they wanted neighbor to be exclusive to actual literal neighbors. But I want us to meditate on how easy it is to add to the Word of God to change it to what we want. And that what we want is not always good. We can sort of chuckle at love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I want us to meditate on the moment because this is a temptation that exists in every single generation. One, we want loopholes out of what God's word actually says. So it's more palatable, so it's easier. So it fits what we want it to be. But there's also always a temptation to not love people in the way that God has called us to love, but in fact, to justify our hatred of others. And we need to be sobered by this blatant editing of the Bible to what they wanted, and to see it in our own hearts. So Jesus will then, again, in a way we've seen before in the Sermon on the Mount, begins to correct what they've been taught and what they as a culture do. Look at verse 44 with me. But I say to you, 
love your enemies, and pray for those who persecute you. Jesus expands and takes their words and flips them around. And says, not only are we to love our neighbors, but to make it clear that the outflow of loving your neighbor is actually loving your enemy and praying for those who persecute you. Notice Jesus doesn't take away the word enemy. Jesus doesn't pretend that they're not people antagonistic to our faith or people that may persecute us. There will always be people in every generation who are simply against Christianity because we believe that Jesus is the only way to be saved. Now, included in that is, may we live in such a way that the only thing people can say against us is that we follow Jesus, but that's another sermon for another time. But what do we do in the face of people who hate us and want to persecute us? We are not to respond likewise. We are not to give them back the hate that they gave us. But we are to love our enemies. Again, going back to the description of 1 Corinthians 13, we are to be kind, we are to be compassionate, we are to care for their good, we are to rejoice in the truth concerning them. A question I want to come back to at the end is this way, is this. In light of these verses, who do you need to love and serve? Who are those people that you need to show compassion to and to care for? The other verb that Jesus gives us along this is to pray for those who persecute you. I want to take a moment and consider how we might pray, the different ways we might pray for those who are antagonistic and hostile to us. We'll see this in a little bit when we talk about rain in a few verses, but it can be appropriate and pleasing to God to pray for the good of those who persecute us. To show generosity that they have not shown to us, to them. For God to provide for their needs. But also, there's another category for prayer that I want you to consider for your own prayer life. And that would be a prayer for enemies to no longer be enemies. We can pray for an end to conflict or misunderstanding. But we can also pray that they would be converted to Christ. And along with that, it, it is appropriate to pray for repentance for other people. That from a clean conscience in our own lives, again, hold speck and piece of wood in our eye. <laughs> but from a place of clean conscience, it's appropriate to pray for repentance that someone would change. In one of the commentaries on this, one of the, one of the authors points to Jesus' prayer from the cross. He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Jesus gives us an example of praying for those who persecute us. And he prayed for them to repent. In that way, we can pray for our enemies to become brothers and sisters in Christ. And when we do that, we are following Jesus' very example. Along these lines, I really appreciated this recent quote from Pastor Tim Keller. He said, All churches must love and identify with their local community and yet at the same time be able and willing to critique and challenge it. This is the better way of love that we are called to. It doesn't mean we erase any differences. It doesn't mean we don't stand up for the truth. 
But there is a complexity of love to which we are called both to speak the truth, but to love and care for unbelievers in a way that will lead them to Jesus. It's appropriate for us in thinking about loving our neighbors and praying for those who persecute us to to think about the application of our personal evangelism. There are many people in our community who are antagonistic to Christianity. And we can connect this to the language of Paul in Romans chapter 5, where before someone believes in Jesus, they are in fact an enemy of God. In one sense, we live in enemy territory. So what are we going to do? While we are not to conform to an unbelieving culture, we are to love our community, even those who are antagonistic to Jesus, with the love of God. We are to pray for our community, even those who are enemies of the gospel, that they would repent of their sins and believe in Jesus. Listen, we know we are called to share the gospel with those who don't know Jesus. But we will not follow that command until we truly love the people in our community. And that is what Jesus is calling us to hear. To love those, even those who are hostile to the faith. The next part of the passage is Jesus sort of creating an argument as to why we should do this and to show us God's example in all of this. And and I hope this both encourages you but also challenges you. So let's first look at verse 45. I'm going to back up to 44 for context. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. When you love your enemies, you act like our God. The phrase that you may be sons could refer to the idea that we show ourselves to be children of God by loving our enemies. There is also a sense in which it could be translated may become sons with the understanding that we are growing in our identity as God's children when we love our enemies. It is connected to this larger idea that in the Christian life we are to grow and mature in holiness and godliness. Loving your enemies is a way to grow in godliness. Why? Because God loves his enemies. Jesus then gives an example from the natural world. God provides the sun for both the evil and the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. Now, while we don't always think of rain as a good thing, Remember the culture of that time in history where most people were farming and or had livestock, both of which need regular rain. And so every time you look at the sun, those fleeting moments that we get the sun, or you experience even more rain, You are experiencing the love of God for all people. So every time you look out to see if you can walk around the block, because is it raining or not, or what coat you need, you are seeing God's love for all. Even for those who never repent and are reconciled to him. And so when we similarly love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us, we are following the example of our Father. As one author about this writes, to bless and pray for those who persecute us is to align oneself with the character of God. 
In verses 46 and 47, Jesus gives another part of his argument as to why we should pursue this better love that God has for us. Look at verses 46 and 47 with me. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Jesus demands more from his followers than simply loving those who love you. In the second part of the question, verse 46, Jesus gives this rhetorical question, meaning there's an implied answer to it. Look at verse 46. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? And the way that this is phrased is meant to be the implied answer of you don't get a reward. Now, there's a theme that runs throughout your Bible that God rewards his people for the good that they do in his name. This theme will be picked up a little later in Matthew chapter 6, which we'll come to in a few weeks. But let me just give you an example. Uh, First off, that Matthew 6 is one of the chapters that talks about storing treasures in heaven. This idea that we have heavenly rewards for the good that we do on earth. But this is how Matthew 6 begins. This is Matthew 6, 1. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Matthew chapter 6, the verse directly after our text today, is a warning against not receiving God's rewards for the good that we do. But for now, I want us to see the context of this, that if you love only those who love you already, you will get no reward. Why? Because even the tax collectors do the same. Now, we can understand that in every age, the people who collect taxes are not popular. But on top of that, we need to step back into the culture of the time. The tax collectors of the time of Jesus were not only the people who collected taxes, they worked for the Roman government. And so they were in league with the oppressive empire of Israel at the time. As one author writes, the Jewish tax collectors were loathed and doubly loathed because they came in contact with the Roman overlords But even these low, traitorous, disgusting people enjoyed friends. Think of Jesus saying it this way, you want a reward for doing the same thing as tax collectors? This is the Christian equivalent of bragging about a participation trophy. Now in late years it has become fashionable to put down participation trophies and I agree with that assessment outside of young children. But I want to use that cultural scoffing to shine a light on this problem. To love only those who love you is like an adult insisting on a great ceremony to celebrate their participation trophy. We would rightfully say you have no grounds to brag about your participation trophy, Mr. 40 year old. In the same way, why would we brag and be proud about loving those who love us? Are we just trying to brag about the Christian equivalent of the participation trophy? Jesus continues on to press home the point in the next verse, in verse 47. If you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same. The word greet here is a stand-in for showing courtesy and respect, and we can understand how that's an aspect of loving others. But if you only show courtesy and respect to your brothers, what more are you doing than others? In other words, what is so special about that? Do not even the Gentiles do the same. Now, the use of that word Gentiles is helpful here because we need to remember that Jesus in his earthly ministry is almost exclusively talking to Jewish people. And so the word translated Gentiles in other translations, like the NIV, where it's translated pagans, 
is because of this almost exclusive Jewish audience that the term Gentile is a stand-in for someone who is an unbeliever. And so the force of the phrase is this, don't even the unbelievers do that. This reinforces that there is nothing special or godly about it if even the unbelieving pagans do it. These verses underscore the higher calling we have as followers of Jesus. We are called to love more and to love better. We are called to stand out in our love, not just match the tax collectors and pagans of our time. I think that this is in view when Jesus says in John chapter 13, by this all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Why would our love show people that we follow Jesus if there's nothing different or better about the way we love? Why would anyone connect our love to Jesus if we just love just like everybody else? The love that points people to Jesus is a better love, a higher love, a love that even includes loving our enemies and praying for those who persecute us. This leads to the last verse of our passage this morning, which highlights this idea of standard. Let's look at verse 48. You, therefore, must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now, structurally, we should see this verse both as the end of our passage today, but also as the end of the larger section of the passage beginning in verse 21 with these, you have heard, but I say to you. All of this has pointed to the higher standing that we are called to have as followers of Jesus. And in this formulation of being perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect, we need to hear the echoes of the Old Testament in places like Leviticus chapter 19. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak to all the congregation of the people of Israel and say to them, You shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. In calling us to love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us, God is calling us to a higher standard, His own standard. The goal is not just to try hard or to be better than those around us. The goal of the life of the Christian is to live like Jesus. To be holy like Jesus. To be perfect like God. I heard this great formulation in an interview I listened to this week that Jesus is both the Savior and the standard. And what is in true focus here is that Jesus himself is the standard for our lives. God shows us his grace to us through faith in Jesus, but God's grace to us does not lower the standard that we are called to live by. Because we have been saved by the grace of God, we pursue the highest standards of godliness. The call of this passage is not to settle for a life of good enough, a life that is the same as everyone else around you. As you reflect on the specific topic today of loving our enemies, also take time to reflect on the other topics covered in Matthew chapter 5. Commands against anger, adultery, lying, revenge. Commands for love, for marriage, for truth for generosity, all of these calling us to the way of following Jesus with every fiber of our being. We are not to be content with anything less. Follow Jesus in a life that pursues the very perfection of God, living a life that's pleasing to our Savior. A couple thoughts to close up this morning. Number one, I want to begin with this, but pray for those who persecute you. Prayer is God's gift to us of a tangible way to love our enemies. And it's something that we can do regardless of circumstances, and we can do it at any time of day. 
Are you praying for the needs of others? Even those who are antagonistic to you. Are you praying for God's blessing on people, even those hostile to the faith? But also, are you praying for repentance and conversion for them? That God would transform them from enemies and persecutors into brothers and sisters. Pray for the people God has placed in your life, even those who act like enemies. Secondly, love and serve your enemies. Again, I told you I'd come back to this question, but who do you need to love and serve this week? Who has God placed on your heart as we talk about loving our enemies and praying for those who persecute us? Who is God putting on your heart today? Let me suggest to you that this is a great season to attempt to love your enemies. Thanksgiving to Christmas, I think, is a Christian time of year. And we can use these cultural echoes of Christianity that exist in our culture to love and serve our neighbors, both friend and enemy. And there's no better way to love your enemies than to share Jesus with them. They're transformed from enemy to brother and sister in Christ. And thirdly, pursue the perfection of of God. This verse and most of chapter 5 comes back to, back to this theme of calling us to a higher righteousness, to a standard of godliness literally found in God himself. Don't settle for acting like everyone else. We're called to imitate the perfect God of the universe. We're called to live as true followers of Jesus and act like him. Live a life of holiness like God and don't settle for anything less. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word to us this morning that we would pursue a higher righteousness, that we would pursue your own perfection. God, that we would specifically pursue a better love, that we would not try to find justifications or loopholes to love in a way that's merely comfortable for us, but that we would be challenged by this passage to love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us. That we would pursue and mimic the love that you have for all people. And in doing so, people would know that we are followers of you and that they would see our good works and praise our Father who is in heaven. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for watching this video from Hillside Evangelical Free Church. Our hope is that these resources will help you grow as a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ. We're located in Greenbank, Washington on Whidbey Island. And if you live in the area and are looking for a church home, we'd love to have you join us. You can find out more information at our website at hillside-efc.com.